Good day. In this lecture, we will be discussing about pairwise alignment. So the outline for this lecture, so we will first um, look at uh, the defi some definitions, for example, homology, orthologs, and paralogs. And then we will look at uh, how to do and what is the difference when to use global and local alignment. And basically, what is global and local alignment? And um, after that, we will look at scoring matrices. And under the scoring matrices, we have the matrices used for nucleotides and for the proteins. So first off, why do we need to do alignments? So alignment is, uh, is used to answer this question that is your gene or protein, is, re is it related to any other gene or protein? So when we talk about relatedness, we can look at uh, how related it is on the sequence level, basically how similar the sequence are. And because of this relatedness, they might be able to have similar functions or their functions might also be related. So that is the, the idea between uh, why do we need to do alignment? Why do we still need to, uh, to compare these two sequences? Now for the proteins and the DNA. So so far, we have two biomolecules uh, among the four. So remember, we have four base, four biomolecules. We have the, the, the carbohydrates, the lipids, the proteins, and the, amino, the DNA. So sorry, the nucleic acids. So among the four, we have two that are being used for alignments currently, uh, which is the DNA and the proteins. Although I believe there are some... Uh, Sequence alignments being studied in the carbohydrates department, but that is more complicated because carbohydrates have branches. Oligosaccharides can have branching uh, sequences, so it's a bit different and st still a relatively new field. But anyway, the established field so far for these alignment sequences are for the DNA, the nucleotides, and for the proteins. So what are the difference in them? So it depends on your needs on what exactly is your question. If you were going to ask, is it better to use the DNA or is it better to use the proteins to align the sequences? It depends on the particular questions or the particular thing. What is it that you really want to know? Uh, now we can, let's first consider the the, the, the number of variations there are. For the nucleic acids, we have four. So because we have four nucleotides, so there are variations, the, the, the sequences varies among the four versus in the case of the proteins, we have the 20 amino acids that make up the, uh, the sequence of, the pro of your proteins. Now uh, we have um, you, um, much significantly greater variety for the case of the proteins versus when we look at just the nucleotides in the DNA. And when another point to consider is the wiggle. So the, the genetic code, if you remember, we have the translation of the nucleic acids. We have codons that is translated to a corresponding amino acid in the sequence when you read your, uh, your mRNA transcript. Now, if you look at your codons, we have a total of 64 codons and we have only 20 amino acids to match with those codons. So there are cases where amino acids uh, have more than one codons. And this this what you call the wiggle at the third position is basically the observation. If you observe at your um, codons, the, the shared amino the shared uh, the amino acids that have multiple codons, they generally have the same uh, nucleotide in the first and the second position, but the third position is um, more variable. So that means um, a certain uh, amino acids can, a certain amino acid have a unique um, first and second uh, codon position, but the third position can be any amino acid. So that is what we call the wiggle. So it's a more variable. So um, basically, you can have uh, a nucleotide change, uh, a, gen uh, a mutation in the nucleotide in the third position, but that is not reflected in the, uh, in the resulting amino acid. Basically, the silent mutations, this is where you have your silent mutations, where there's change in the, the DNA, but 
if you look at the protein, there's really no, no change because there's the wiggle. Because the third position can be variable. In some cases, not all cases, for the translated amino acid or the corresponding amino acid. So that is your wiggle. So sometimes it's... it's the, if we want to really look at uh, genetics, um, genealogy, we look. We tend to look at the, the nucleic acids because it tells us more about um, the the relatedness of genealogy, which could not be visible when you look at only the protein sequences. Now, for the uh, the third uh, bullet here is the amino acid with the similar properties. So, for the case with the similar properties, now remember, amino acids have um, we can group our amino acids into hydrophobic, hydrophilic, and charged, hydrophilic, charged amino acids. We have sulfur containing amino acid, etc. etc. So, some amino acids have similar properties. Okay, for example, you have the leucine and the isoleucine, they are both hydrophobic, they are actually very similar with they are just basically isomers of one another so that is uh, similar property similarity in the properties of your amino acids so sometimes when you have mutations or changes in the amino acids if the amino acid change to a similar amino acid for example a, a mutation from leucine to isoleucine or vice versa you can have um, generally no significant functional changes or no significant changes, no drastic changes in the resulting protein. So uh, there is a change, but it really doesn't matter that much. So that's that's those are some uh, things that you can see or we can consider. So let's look at other uh, the definition side. So we when we talk about sequence similarities, we almost always uh, encounter the term homology. But what exactly is homology? So homology, by definition, it's the state of having the same or a similar relation, uh, a relative position or a structure. So for example, here is the arm of a human and the arm of a frog. So these structures are considered homologous because if you look at them, they look the same. Uh, they, ha they have four fingers, we have a thumb, a shorter thumb region you have uh, two four two bones in the four limbs and you have uh, one uh, bone in the arm bone basically they have they are similar but but in terms of homology we tend to it it, it bears the connotation of being a qualitative side of uh, qualitative um this uh, qualitative uh, quality or a qualitative similarity where it's really different, difficult to, to, to provide a score. Now, we can have, uh, we can analyze this one more objectively by assigning it a quantitative description. And that is where similarity and identity comes in. So the similarity and identity, so this, uh, let's look at this um, bottom, uh, the, the, the bottom, uh, Bullets. So, what is the difference between a similarity and identity? So, in terms of uh, the one, this is based on the quantitative. Um, we want to quantitate how similar or how the homology of these uh, structures or these molecules. We want to quantitate them. So, we, we apply it based on their similarity and identity. Now, when we say identity or identical, they must have the exact same amino acid or the exact same nucleotide. So it is not, uh, if it's leucine, it should be leucine. So that means it's identical. When we say it's similar, they, uh, they, they, we can classify, for example, uh, leucine is similar to um, isoleucine. So we can have a similar score. Uh, we can have the same score for them because they are similar amino acids. So similar, when we say similar, they have the same biological biochemical properties, but they are not necessarily have be the exact the same uh, molecule. So case in point is the leucine and the isoleucine. So that is uh, similar and identical. So when we look at similarity, it's a much more um, loose way of uh, checking for uh, the, the, the similarity of the sequences versus uh, identical sequences where we the, the exact identity must be the same for, for the two sequences that we are comparing. So anyway, that's the similar versus the identical. 
Now, other other terms that we encounter are the orthologs and the paralogs. So, orthologs have the same function, but they have uh, different sequence and low sequence similarity. So, an example here is a myoglobin and hemoglobin. So, in terms of function, they have actually uh, this is a correction. This is not the same function, but a similar function. But they both have the same heme group. They interact with their function, they utilize the heme group for the similar function, which is for uh, binding oxygen. But I said that they don't exactly have the same function because myoglobin is more of a storage for um, oxygen, whereas hemoglobin is more of a transporter. Okay, now when you look at their myoglobin and hemoglobin, they have similar structures, the three dimensional structures of both of them are similar, uh, in particular, myoglobin and a globin of hemoglobin, because hemoglobin is a four subunit protein, but one subunit of hemoglobin have similar structure to, the, to myoglobin. But if you look at their actual sequences, they ha have largely different sequences, and they can be considered orthologs. So they have similarity in function, but the, their, their, se their sequence is not similar. So an example of, an, or another example of ortholog is the wings of a butterfly and the wings of a bird. So they have similar functions, they are used to fly, but the wings of a butterfly are very different. They are structurally different compared to the wings of a bird. So the wings of a bird have more, uh, it has bones, it has skin, it has um, muscles, it has feathers. The, the wings of a butterfly is so made up of a different type of um, biomaterial altogether. So you have that ortho, they are orthologs because they they are they serve the same purpose, but they are not exactly uh, when you look at them uh, molecularly in the molecular view in the structurally they are different. Now uh, the not exactly opposite of that, but on the other on the other side of the spectrum we have the paralogs. For the paralogs, they have the same identity, but they have the distinct distinct and different functions. So an example here is the alpha one and the alpha two globins in hemoglobin. So they they have uh, same identity but different functions. So another example would be the um, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in our brain and in our muscles. So Generally, they are the same. They, when you compare their sequences, they, they have high sequence identity, meaning they have highly similar sequences, but they, they serve different functions. They, uh, one, is in, uh, one is a receptor in the brain, the other is a receptor for the muscles. So the function in the muscle is to move your muscle, the function is the brain for the firing of the, amino, of the neurons. So another example are uh, the uh, glute glucose transporters. So glucose transporters, we have glucose transporters in the brain, we have glucose trans different type of glucose transporter in the muscles, another type of glucose transporter in the uh, in the liver. So this glucose transporter, they are they are very, very similar. If you look at their sequence, they are similar, but these transporters serve different functions. The, the glucose transporters in the brain, they transfer glucose. Okay, they trans all of them transfer glucose. But uh, for the brain, they always transfer glucose. For the, the muscles, they are only um, activated uh, with, in the presence of the insulin, so they are not always active. And for the, um, for the liver, they are quite loose, so they allow the, the, the passage in and out of your, um, of your sugar. So they, they serve different functions. The, the way to use them, the way our body uses them is different, but they are technically the same tool. It's like having the same tool, but using those tools in a different manner. So an, an, an analogous example is, for example, chopsticks. So you can use chopsticks to eat, but some people can use chopsticks to tie their hair. So it's the same chopstick, but different functions. So those are paralogs. Okay. Now, what do how how do we do um, pairwise alignment? So in pairwise alignment, there's always the issue of being a pair. So you have two sequences that we want to compare. 
so that is all that's the thing with bear attendance so it's always two by two uh by bear so you have a query and a subject so this is the this is our reference this is the the, the one that we want to, to compare it so the, the query is the one it's like um using google search so the query you type the, the thing you type in the search bar and the, the the google will search for the database for a similar uh results or to your query now here is uh, a stretch of your um this is the human beta globin which is the query and the myoglobin which is your subject so the the lines here so where is my mouse okay so you have here query and subject so number four and three this is the amino acid fourth amino acid starting this one started the fourth amino acid this one started third so amino acid four so four to 61 so these are the amino acids four to 61 and then you have 62 to 121 one thing to 146 so anyway that's that's your amino acids now we have here the, the whole this whole part here the score is 43.9 bits so that's the calculated score uh and you have an expect value of one e raised to negative nine the method is uh, composition based stats so we have here uh, various um scores uh values that what exactly do those values mean so let's look at this score score is basically the this uh how should i say this the 18.1 okay so this is when you uh when you have this the summation of the matches mismatch and the gaps with corrections that is your score so now the expect value is uh what is the uh this is more of a statistically uh probably statistical probability of finding a much more similar structure than the, the subject that we have in your database so basically that's your expect value now for the identities identities are here we have 95 percent identity so that basically tells us that these are the uh identical amino acids 37 identical amino acids among the, the total amino acids that we have so we have here a 25 percent identical amino acids so here we have another one which is positives so these are more on the similarities so positive is a similar but not exactly identical amino acid so we have more 57 because we accept similarities versus um the non uh, identical now similar amino acids so positives over 145 so that's a 39 percent and then the gaps how many gaps are there so how many um we introduced the gaps gap opening here so how many gaps were opened and uh, in, uh, added in the sequence for them to match properly so we usually introduce gaps because you want them to really match well uh, basically the best alignment thereof of these two uh, stretches of amino acids so let's look at this one a shorter one because this one is much longer it's much difficult to look at now let's look at the shorter one so the query is for starting from amino acid 12 to 33 so that is the green one here and uh this is for the subject 11 to 34. now we have the matches so v w g k v d so these are the match and then what is this plus this plus is a matching not in identity but in terms of similarity so these are similar amino acids so we have here a score so there's an actually an arbitrary scoring here so some of the matches plus 60 round up to 61 and then we have your mismatch so there's a mismatch penalty so if there's not a match here you have a mismatch a penalty of a mismatch and the sum of them is negative 13. so gap opening is negative 11 and the gap extend is negative 2. so if you get the total row score of that you have here 35. so this is a row score which is just the sum of all the matches the mismatch and the gap penalties you have so that's basically uh the basics of um scoring or finding for for the similarities of these two sequence alignment 
So in sequence alignment, we consider the gaps, the insertions, the deletions, and the substitutions. So this, uh, this, the differences in the sequences are caused by possible insertions, deletions, and then the mismatches is from substitution. Now, what about local and global alignment? So for the local alignment, we have here, if you look at this one, we have two sequences, your query, which is the shorter one, and the target, which is the much longer one. In the local alignment, if you notice, your query sequence just matches to a certain segment of your target, but not the whole segment. So take note, you have here uh, overhangs over in this both sides. So it just match on this particular region. So that's your local alignment. Local alignment just looks at specific regions where your query can have matches, but not it doesn't seek to match the, the query with the target. Now for the global, it's the opposite. So for the global alignment, you want to match end-to-end -end your query and your target. So that's why we try to stretch your query, which is the shorter one, as much as we can for it to fit your target sequence. So we stretch it by introducing gaps. And that is your global alignment score. So depending on what you want to do, you can use a local alignment or a global alignment. Although for the most common algorithms nowadays, local alignment is a much faster method than the global alignment. Now, when do you usually use a global alignment? We usually use global alignment for checking for, uh, for, uh, for example, very closely related uh, species or even uh, closely related within the same species, perhaps it's a strain. So we use global alignment because we expect that they are very, very similar and we just want to see the, the uh, individual differences between the two sequences, for example, the two strains or the two species. So that we usually use global alignment if we have comparisons between very, very similar um, sequences. For example, is let's have a concrete example. For example, the coronavirus spike protein uh, strain ng Delta variant versus the one in the Omicron variant. So we can do global alignment with them. Now, for the local alignment, this one is comparison between uh, more decently related sequences. For example, the 16S, uh, no, let's say um, we have the protease, uh, sustained protease of, uh, of, of your, let's say, sustained protease of a rat and a sustained protease of a plant or a bacteria. So we can use uh, local alignment on that. Um, well, we can also use global alignment, but we just tend to use local alignment much faster. So that is where we do that. Or we can actually use that to look at fragments. Uh, certain domains tend to fold in a similar manner. And because of this similarity in the domain, similarity in the folding, they might have similar structures. So we might have an unknown protein. We want to know what exactly is that protein for. If there is no exact match, we can use local alignment to search if what that protein, to have an idea what that unknown protein might uh, be used for, what it might be its function. Is it structural? Is it a, a catalyst? Is it um, uh, an enzymatic protein, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So that's uh, the local the local alignment. Now again, it depends on what you want to do. So that is why in bioinformatics, it's very important to know. What is it you are really looking for? Because there's a lot of tools here. There are a lot of available tools, a lot of variations. We can actually do a lot of things. The only thing is we need to know what we really want to do. So we must be able to uh, streamline our ourselves. We must be able to have defined limitations on what we want to do what we want to know or what we want to find out in order to properly use the tools that we have. Okay, so this is a more of a summary of the global, uh, summary comparison of the global sequence alignment and the local sequence alignment. So for the global alignment, so the atom is made to add to align the entire sequence. So again, as I said, this is an end-to-end -end alignment. But for the local sequence alignment, it just looks at specific regions with the highest level of similarities, but it doesn't seek to match them all end to end. 
Now, the global alignment contains all letters from both your query and target sequences, whereas the local alignment aligns the substring of the query to a substring of the target sequences. So again, this is not local alignment, it's not end to end. We don't want we don't really have to look at the whole sequence, just localized localized parts. That's why it's called local alignment. And then if the two for the global alignment, if two sequences have approximately the same length and are quite similar, they are more suitable for global alignment. But if you have, um, we usually use local alignment uh, for to find stretches of sequences with high level of matches without considering the alignment of the rest of the sequence results. Well, in, in that regard, global alignment is much more suitable for aligning the closely related sequences Whereas for the local sequence alignment, it's suitable for aligning a more divergent or distantly related sequences. So when do we usually use them? So global alignments are usually done for comparing homologous genes, like comparing two genes with the same functions, as I said before, or two proteins with similar function. But for local alignment, it, it's much more flexible, actually. Local alignment is much more flexible. It's usually done for a much wider applications. So they are used for finding out conserved patterns in DNA sequences or conserved domains or motifs of two proteins. So we have an algorithm used for doing this alignment. We don't do this manually because it's very laborious. So the, the, the algorithm used for the global alignment is the needleman wunsch and the uh, local alignment is the smith waterman Now, this here are some recent examples of alignment tools. We have the emboss nida because it's a needleman wunsch whereas emboss water for the, 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 the local alignment. We have BLAST. BLAST is a lo basic local alignment here, hence the name local alignment. And then we have the specialized BLAST version, the needleman wunsch global alignment with right sequence. It's just specialized blast search and then we also have l align for a local alignment so these are some uh, alignment sequence or sequence alignment tools that we can use so how does this um, pairwise alignment do so that will be the topic of the the next video to this one